So hello, Nicole, and welcome to the show. Thank you for agreeing to come and sit down with me today to talk about your life, your experiences, and two different groups today. We've been friends in the cult awareness space for a while now, so this is a really special day and a long day coming as well. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Well, first, I'd like to thank you. I agree it is a special day, and I'm excited that we get a chance to sit down and talk for a couple of hours and that listeners and other survivors in this space get to know me better as well as I'd like to know about them sometimes. And it's also special because it is my favorite podcast. And I say that because as a survivor, the the way that topics are handled and the guests that you choose present subjects in a comforting way rather than a way that's re-traumatizing, which um, I think is probably difficult to do. And I was nervous at first and listening to survivor stories, but it's just my comfort podcast. <laughs> That's fantastic. Also appreci- Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 this, this might seem like a little thing, but I love the fact that there's no like wacky sound effects and the intro and outro music is calm because I think it's important to approach subjects when you're in like a non-stimulated state right you know? right yeah okay so I'll avoid putting in the sound effects <laughs> over the top of anything <laughs> I have a, a another podcast I listen to and they had a week where they installed a new like soundboard and they were just pushing buttons because they were so excited. Like, and I was like, this is not fun. It's fun. It's fun when you're doing it, I imagine. But I was like, I don't know what's coming next. And it's, I'm, I'm stressed. <laughs> you a great job. Keep it up. Don't change anything. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit before we jump into things about you as a person. Who is Nicole? Well, I call myself a survivor because when I listened to Minerva on those early episodes, I agreed with what she had to say. And I've also been calling myself an independent scholar because I like to read research papers, but I just read. I don't conduct my own research, maybe someday. We are going to be starting the first half of our talk um, about an evangelical church group. Is this a group that you were born and raised in or a group that you found later in life? Well, I was definitely raised in it. I was four years old when my family joined, but we had already had ties to the group because my dad was converted by a family member from the group and then he converted my mom and then they moved and found a group that had similar beliefs and practices so i i grew up in that um mentality and that lifestyle since i was born but then we officially joined the group when I was four, after my parents had been married five years. When we talk about an evangelical church group and we keep it quite vague, is there anything that you can give us on historical context or background on this movement whilst kind of maintaining some of that anonymity? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I can tell you sort of the story that my ex-pastor slash cult leader gave to us. So it was the usual, he was a sinner and he was floundering until he found his pastor and his church group, which happens to be a large cult in Baltimore. It's also, you know, an evangelical church cult and it's been called out just like my church has been called out by the greater evangelical community as a cult and he was mentored by this pastor 
But of course, you know, the way my ex pastor told it was that, um, you know, he, he, he couldn't possibly do that role, you know, um, but then as these stories usually go, he finally came to accept that he had a special calling and a special gift. And so he brought that gift back home. And this was probably the 1970s. So by 1985, he had grown his ministry um, to be large enough to have a Christian day school. And it's heyday when, which was when I was in high school, it was international, sort of. I think, I think what happened is he had found some churches in Greece and um, some local, local churches as, as well and, and tried to kind of take them over, kind of put them under our umbrella. Right. He called it church planting, but there really wasn't any work being done by him or anyone in his ministry if if there was work being done in that way there was a lot of tension but um during this time during its heyday there were over a thousand members so church services were split in two to fit everybody in the building even though there were always building projects and we had a very large building at the time. It was televised, recorded for radio, and um, you could get the recordings in the bookstore. So there was a bookstore, there was a gymnasium, a cafeteria, and a Bible college. And so it was this huge campus, which I, I've showed, I don't know if you got a chance to look at the link, but you can take a look. It's 36 acres and the building is still kind of state of the art by today's standards. His office had a shower and cherry wood furnishings and a view for him that overlooked a parking lot because he said he loved to see how many people were there. And of course there are special places up front for um, him and his wife for their sports cars. And there were pristine baseball fields donated by a local professional player, but they oh, wow. weren't really used. They were kept as um, like the parlor. I don't know if in the UK you have, um, where, where I grew up, which is an, an immigrant community, had a second living room called the parlor. And it was just for show. It's just like very, very special occasions. Right very decorative yeah the couches were covered in plastic you know it wasn't really for use so the baseball fields were like that just decorative looking look look impressive but not really ever used oh my goodness this is kind of giving me Gwen Shamblin vibes you know like you would go there for the day and you wouldn't have to leave because everything that you would need you would be able to find in this one location Yes, um, except for the baseball fields, because those were just for shows. It was talked about when, on a very regular basis and used as advertisement to draw people in. But um, I, I remember using it maybe twice as a student there, and I don't think the adults got to use it either. Oh, my goodness. This is this is. A lot bigger than I realized. Your pastor, he had a he had a pastor that he called his mentor. Does this mean that your group was part of his pastor's pastor's umbrella, or did your pastor break away to start his own ministry? He broke away to start his own ministry, and they did have sort of a sort of a relationship but I get the sense that it was kind of on again and off again and I don't think it ended on good terms in the end right right right. okay and you talked about there being a day school is this something that you attended when you were younger 
Yes, I was homeschooled at first until grade five. And then from grade five through 12, I was there. And how old are you in grade five? 10. Right. Okay. So there's a, there's a small window there from the ages four to 10. Do you have any notable memories to talk about of your time being homeschooled before you enrolled into the day school? Sure. So I went to the day school for gym and art. I think it was just a choice that my mom made to be close to me while I was younger um, during those important ages, plus a financial decision to homeschool me because the day school cost money. She found a way to pay for it later on by becoming a teacher there. But um, yeah, homeschooling was mainly through a Becca books. Right. And we used some of that curriculum in the day school as well, as well as PACE. So what do those two things mean for anybody that's not heard of, of, of specific homeschool curriculum or Christian homeschool curriculum in America? Yeah, a Becca is... I don't know how to describe it because it's it's a regular textbook, but it's just highly filtered. There's nothing about evolution in there except to say that it's false. And there's an education about slavery, but it's justified. So... Yeah, it's just a really biased curriculum from, I, I forget who puts it out, some, someone in the South, some, I believe it has Baptist ties, you probably know better than I do from other conversations. And PACE is a, oh, it stands for Packet of Accelerated Christian Education, and those were these little booklets that you would go through self-paced and take an exam at the end. So it was all about cramming the information in for the exam. I retained absolutely no knowledge from any of those courses. And it was also very, it was even, it was even more of an indoctrination than a Becca was in a way because they had these little cartoon characters that would pop up and the, you know they were dressed like Mormons would be you know it was it was usually a, a little white boy with his you know cute boy haircut and in the precious moments way you know and then his his white collared button down shirt with his thin tie and he would right. say like interrupt the lessons to give you the the background behind the lesson that was from a, a Christian worldview. Did you have any wild realizations later on in life on the inaccuracies of these teachings in terms of slavery and in terms of evolution? I can't remember that I don't think so I think I just accepted everything as it was presented to me it wasn't until I started going out in air quotes into the world uh, for my job and um, got to go to Disney because that was banned you couldn't go to Disney and I was exposed to people in the LGBT community for the first time and realized these people are okay. They, they know love and um, saw um, species that, that were considered, that would have been considered transitional forms and impossible at the aquarium in Disney, they, they were there. I, I, I laid my eyes on them, they existed. That the cracks in the teachings began to show. 
Oh, okay. So there's a few things to discuss there because I want to know how you ended up at Disney. But first of all, let's okay. talk about <laughs> your mum gets a job at the school when you're age 10 and that gives you uh, a kind of a, a way to attend the day school. Is this something you wanted for yourself or thought you wanted for yourself as a, as a young person or something that your parents wanted more so? That's a good question. I do remember feeling isolated because I did hang out with kids in the neighborhood and I did feel weird. And I'm not sure that I wanted to go to public school, but it did feel like I was sort of a doomed isn't really the right word, but it was, you know, my my lot in a way to just be different and when you got to the day school was it significantly different being surrounded by loads of other children going through the same similar curriculum that was also isolating because I had been homeschooled when I had gone for gym and art, it was sort of like, you know, what are you doing here? Um, I was always, you know, the weird one for, for being homeschooled. So I, yeah, I didn't find immediate connection. Plus there was, to, to add to that, I, I was in sort of like a waspy community and I was from a, a poor immigrant family like my my parents were born in the U.S. but we lived with my great-grandmother that I called Vavo and I was different for that reason there were a couple of other kids but they were full-blooded and I was only um you know so to the last, the last, because that, I'm not trying to be derogatory, just, you know, typical, uh, uh, from, from families that have, have been in the U S and established and have a little bit mon more money. They live in the suburbs. Uh, their parents <clears throat> probably were more educated. I, I was not one of them either. So all of those things together, um, yes, yeah, I would say just added to the, the feeling that even though we had, had this common curriculum, I was still a little different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also the consideration then that more time for you and your family is being spent on this acreage. So what would you say a typical day, week, and month look like for you and your family as members of this particular church? Yeah, so everyone was expected to wake up in the morning and pray and have their devotional or Bible study. And everyone's lives are a little different because they did go to work and nobody lived on campus, but some people did you know, like my mom work on campus and I went to school there. So in the morning at school, we also had prayer and devotional and devotional did require us to write reports. And we had homework too. We had, we had to write reports at home as well and bring them in. And they were personal reflections on how the devotionals of courses then once a week we had chapel and I was on the worship team, which was a huge deal because I was very shy. But um, if there's one thing in church that you learn how to do, it is to sing. Then after school, we just had an inordinate amount of homework. I had several long-term reports due per week. And this is starting in middle school. This isn't just high school. Of course it got worse in high school, but um, by long form papers, I mean, seven to 20 pages, well-researched re and cited. I had 
for one class to outline the chapter reading, but when I just tried to outline it in bullet points, I got in trouble because the teacher wanted me to copy everything down, basically word for word in full sentences. And so I was staying up until 2 a.m. a lot of nights. My mom and I complained about it, but I was told this is my duty as a student. And that was that. There was, there was no way to change that. Congregants were, in, again, again in air quotes, strongly encouraged to attend a midweek service. So I'd have to put down my homework, go to this midweek service. This was in addition to Sunday service, of course. And um, two midweek services were optional, but you were seen as extra dedicated if you did go. And if you worked at the church, you were, again, strongly encouraged to go to two services. So often my family did that because my mom worked there. And we were told this basically undisguised from the pulpit. The pastor would say he could see us in our seats and he took mental notes of who was there. And after service, it was basically required to shake his hand. And I say all of these things conditionally because nothing was, was like a strict rule that was like checked off on a clipboard or anything but people would get pulled aside. We would get spoken to during the service. I remember one service where he said, you know, he was upset and disappointed that some people had left without shaking his hand. And, you know, we should really do that. And he gave us reasons why. So if we didn't do these things, there were unpleasant ramifications. Right. Um, some people, yeah, some people, um, I can't really tell their stories, but some people did get fired for not following the rules. So um, in addition to that, when I became a teacher, I'm, I'm sorry, not a teacher, a teenager, I went to youth group um, one night a week and that was probably worse than school at both youth group and school. I got singled out often for not being more enthusiastic. So there was a lot of emotion policing. You're expected to be very extroverted and charismatic in your worship, but I was uh, not that way naturally. Plus I was depressed as a child and a teenager. And then on Saturdays, my parents did the intramural sports, not, not at our baseball field, at the town's baseball <laughs> field. It was probably, they were probably more active before the baseball fields were built. And then I did soul winning or Bible study when I got my license because I was, was very sold out, as you would say, in those days. I was completely bought in. So I also spent Saturdays your, there. This is your license, your driving license? Yes, yes. I did get my driving license and I drove myself to church sponsored events or sometimes we would just come up with our own Bible studies, mm. but it was encouraged and and I did do that. So even though we didn't live there, it's like, I basically lived there. You yeah. Know? Oh my goodness. You're spending almost every single day there and you're having your, some so-called education there and your family are spending all this time there. And when you're not there, the curriculum is so demanding. It's an entire doctrination train. Like the entire, the entire situation feels like an indoctrination train even when you're at home you're having to stay up till the early hours of the morning to write propaganda down essentially word for word on a piece of paper so even when you're going to sleep you're probably still thinking about all of these things that you stayed up late writing about it that's all encapsulating it feels like 
it definitely was all encapsulating. And to be fair, I think I did get a good education because I, I did well in college, all that writing and reading and we, you know, learned math and, um, analytical skills because we would study the Bible. So I did get a decent, um, set of skills uh, of study skills. So, so I will say that, but it yeah. was exhausting and yeah, it was on my mind constantly. So there's no time here for anything else. You're not making plans with people outside of this environment to go to the pictures or go out for coffee or food or whatever it is the, the kids do these days. <laughs> <laughs> not much, especially me, because, yeah, I was um, probably more dedicated than some of the other students. I was was um you know a straight a student and i was also sold out for jesus as we said in the day so i was yeah i was i had a reputation for being a goody two shoes okay and yeah. that i i wonder if that comes from your struggles to find a place where you felt like you fit in like some of the other children may have seemed like they fit in. Maybe I have talked to, you know, some of the other students and they were going through a lot of what I was going through. We, we all felt, except for maybe the small group of popular kids that sort of, they were able to carp, compartmentalize all of this and they did you know go out and do normal teenage stuff but the rest of us who did not compartmentalize it and it was our lives we all went through the same things and we we eventually we we found each other in that environment but we were holding each other accountable Right. We did eventually find each other later in life too and say, oh my goodness, that was actually horrible. But when you spoke about how in the youth group, people would talk about there being a lack of enthusiasm, if that was coming from the youth group leaders or whether that was coming from the other children, because there's often in these environments from from what other people have talked about this level of s sort of um presenting yourself as as the most devoted and perfect congregant and then also kind of gossiping or judging other members when there appears to be an obvious lapse in their perfection and devotion and when the pastor is calling people out for those things, and if the children are seeing parents speak this way or the pastor speak this way, if that was coming through in the other environments where it's kids speaking to kids in a way that they've mm -hmm. experienced adults speaking to and about other adults. Yeah, there was some of that. I, I do have a whole um big formative experience around that but it was mainly the youth leaders they would take us aside individually and just ream us out like yelling and screaming or from the pulpit just stop everything stop the worship stop the preaching and just start railing into us because there was less oversight on those nights there was just you know like two guys in the building with a bunch of teenagers maybe one female chaperone you know and and they could just say whatever they they wanted to they could talk about sex which they did frequently and it was very weird um as a you know teenage girl to hear a middle-aged guy talk about sex <laughs> 
from the pulpit Mm -hmm. to all of us. That stuff was not on my mind. I did not want to know. I did not want to know it was on his mind. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) So I did find that that weird. When you ask, you know, some of the things I found the charisma, uh, I mean, the charismatic side weird. I just was not into that. And I also was not into hearing about sex even if it was presented in a way that was again air quotes pure because it really wasn't it really wasn't pure I I should not have been it was not appropriate so that that's how I felt about it yeah yeah I kind of uh, listening to you talk about it also feel a bit uncomfortable as well and imagine (laughs) I would kind of be thinking what is happening here I don't understand what's going on In terms of the restrictions that are placed on individuals inside this environment, it's clear that there is a restriction on your leisure time um, or an expectation for you to restrict your leisure time and dedicate most of, of, of the free time you have or all of your time to this particular ministry. Were you expected to dress a certain way with inside this group? Yes, we were all supposed to dress modestly, but that was focused on females. So in school, we we had an extra dress dress code, and we were supposed to wear long, loose skirts, hosiery, and low heeled shoes, which you can see in that photo that I sent you. And then the grown, <laughs> yeah, it looks. It's so typical, right? And then the women in ministry, the old, the older women that were in the music ministry, for example, they had to dress similar, but it could be a little bit sexier. So, you know, it could be colorful, more form fitting, go just below the knee, and which, which I think we could do too, but we. We couldn't find any skirts like that and high, higher heels, but yeah, modesty was big. And we were also heavily discouraged from pursuing an outside education. So when I decided to go to a different Bible college, not the one that was uh, run by my church, I turned a lot of heads and ended up rocking the boat. Several others had tried to go to Moody Bible Institute, which, as you know, is very fundamental. And they came back and testified basically that nowhere else on earth taught the truth like it was taught here at our church. So... I'm I'm not sure what happened there, but it, it after a while it felt like a performance. It felt like this thing that you were supposed to do. You were supposed to come back and testify. There's no place like overselling. This, you know? Overselling. Oh, okay. When you yeah, when you go to all of these services, these midweek services that you know you you don't have to go to, but you do have to go to. Is yeah. there tithing expected at every service you attend? Oh, <laughs> so yeah, tithing is an interesting subject because this this church, I, I think the catalyst for it being exposed in the greater evangelical community, which is saying a lot, right? They mishandled money and yes we we were supposed to tithe I don't think it was at every service but it was 10 percent of our income if you were one of the good ones like me uh, um you know I don't I mean that in in the view of the the church you gave 10 percent of your pre-tax income so for right. me when I started working that was about 30%, right? And then and then taxes because I was um be, because of how I I filed 
as a dependent, that was another 25 to 30%, you know, so I, I did, I didn't keep much of my money when I was working and saving for college. I, I kept maybe half if I was lucky. So yeah, but the, the, one of the accusations against the pastor, which he admitted to, so we can presume it's true, was that for a time he would peek and see who was tithing and how much, and he would sort of kiss up to those people that um, had larger incomes, including the baseball player, people who owned businesses, and yeah. He, he kind of built, he built various circles of loyalty and, um, and, and filled, filled it as much as he could with people who had needs. Right, right. So there's, there's definitely um, an agenda there, I would say, in terms of the, the strategies being used to cozy up to the people that could financially support his mission more so than others which is kind of an interesting thing to think about because uh, uh, is somebody with less money worth less in the eyes of Jesus Christ or God and I mean that's an impossible question to answer but it's just one to put out there and say like if you're if you're truly taking the positive teachings of the Bible and applying them to a ministry, surely everyone is supposed to be equal if they're following the 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 the, the rules of the Bible. And some of those rules don't yeah. state the more money you give, the purer you are, the closer to God, and so on. <laughs> uh, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, there were a lot of opposites. Mm -hmm. I, one of the first lessons that I, I learned in life when I looked back on my experience was that wasn't love. And I, I learned love from outside sources. So that was the yeah. biggest one. Often it's kind of like faux conditional love. Like you mm -hmm. are as a family accepted into this space um, and and shown certain types of congregational affection as long as you're doing these things that are expected of you, which at most times uh, are, are impossible expectations. And it's exhausting and keeps people in this state of doubt and keeps people in this, this state of striving to be more than they can possibly be. And by putting these expectations even just time-wise and financially on individuals makes me wonder how the adults and the parents must have been feeling about their involvement with the church. Um, and does it give capacity to even consider what the children are experiencing? And of course, we should always be thinking about what our children are experiencing, but psychologically, maybe there's just no space for that. And I can't speak to that because I have not had one of these experiences, but it's just something I think about in my mind, how, uh, how first generation individuals must have been feeling or if they even realized or recognized any of those thoughts or feelings because you're just drowning in this ministry. But you've talked about going to college, controversial college, You've talked about going to controversial college and driving uh, around, passing your test and getting a job. What do those things entail? And how is it that you come to eventually leave this group? Because there's a second part to this story. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I left both mentally and physically in baby steps which I've, I've talked about a little bit. First, I decided to go to a different Bible college just because I was, was sick of being where I was. I was starting to feel the, the fishbowl effect and I was just too miserable. I, I had to 
to do something else. And I, I've come to realize that that Bible college was also a cult, but it felt very liberating at the time. So that's saying a lot. <laughs> and I, at, I began to work to save up for college. And at, at work, I met non-Christians, including Catholics, whom we considered non-Christian, right? I know now they're Christians, but at the time they were not considered uh, saved or anybody that you would want to um, uh, associate with too closely. And I, I realized that these friends that I made were showing more friendship than what I had experienced in the cults, which at the time I didn't realize was a cult. People had told me, but I still called it church, right? So then at college, I learned about evolution in a way that was not filtered. And I still had questions, but they were scientific questions and I learned logic and um in fact I think that class was together I think yeah I learned I learned both in the same class and and had a professor that was very patient with me and answered all my questions so um then the final blow of physically leaving was I got engaged and I had been taught to follow the man, um, you know, where he would lead me geographically, spiritually, etc. So I started going to my husband's church and then I had a confrontation personally from the pastor. I had experienced confrontations from his family members earlier if I had talked to ex-members. But this time he confronted me personally and it was a very manipulative way. It was weird. I didn't listen. But then the wedding was just a fiasco because he scared my mom and insisted that he preach at my wedding and we get married in his church and not my father-in-law's church. His, um, my father-in-law was pastor of his own church. And then the message he preached was, was the same salvation gospel message but many there at my wedding including one of my great aunts thought it was too morbid for the occasion and it got even more morbid comparing my husband to Christ and um you know he should be prepared to die for me and it just wasn't a very happy <laughs> occasion. So um, that was just kind of the fallout from me leaving. Oh, that sounds like your butt cheeks must have been clenched the entire day of just, you know, when, when you're just, when I'm, when you're sitting there listening to somebody talk about things that make you feel so uncomfortable that your butt cheeks are just <laughs> and you can't you can't do anything else and this is your day and he's made it about him he's made it his wedding and he's clearly either threatened or trying to m measure up to his, his, your father-in-law or, or prove some kind of point against somebody else who is also a pastor working in the religious space I mean what do you think the motivations were behind all of these things to get you all to move over to his church or to try and scare you into staying or, or converting everybody over. I just don't see what his goals were with this entire thing. And it's your wedding day. I mean, it's your day, isn't it? You and your husband celebrating your union, your love. So that must have also just been exhausting and devastating as well. 
Well, yeah, I was, I was, I was used to him being like that. And I, I, um, yeah, the, that part negotiating everything up till then was stressful, but then I was just kind of, yeah, just, just tired of it. I was like, okay, whatever I'm getting married. And I was excited about getting married, but his motivations, I think were all, all of what you said. I think he did feel threatened. I think, I think I have seen competition from him before. I've seen him poaching members from other churches. Yes, he expected people to bring in their spouses and their families and stay because possibly that meant more money if families stayed there for generations, you know. Have you renewed your vows or anything since and kind of had a redo of that whole day not yet we've talked about it you need and, to and honestly, you need to yeah. yeah that would be beautiful yeah. without without any interference from from kind of big bally men <laughs> yeah and and we're lucky to do that I heard from other people that he's ruined funerals <laughs> oh my so, gosh yeah He's just very, or he was, I don't, I don't know who he is today, but he was very self-centered. And this is the big catalyst for you making some big changes in your life. I would say that it was still gradual as far right. as deconstructing. Everything took a lot of time and I th I think having children changed a lot of how I thought because this sounds kind of silly but I started reading picture books to my kids and I was only allowed to read you know bible stories maybe maybe a couple of you know, approved picture books. And part of it was we didn't have money and that's what we had. And the other part was everything had to be under a certain lens. And I, I read about these cute little lessons from people who supposedly didn't know anything about life, right? <laughs> and <laughs> um yeah, another another thing was when I had my son, we didn't go to church for six weeks. And we we both realized that was really nice. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We we got like the space, you know, the mental space, like what you were talking about before. If the indoctrination occupies your mind, you don't have time to ask any of the other questions so and then of course there were po political things going on at the time and and evangelicals were oh well there was the whole um in the united states um gay marriage question and like i said i knew some people that i i thought should be able to get married because they did understand love and they loved each other and i was taught no, that's not real love. People in the world can't understand real love. And, you know, people um, in that space just didn't think it should be allowed. And, and those politics were part of the beliefs. And I just, I just was not following them down that road. So yeah, it was just little things like that. I think just being an adult and, and, and getting away I, I just had that little instinct, right, to push myself a little further. Why don't I go outside and talk to other Christians? And then it was, you know, other, pe other people in general. And yeah, it was just baby steps. Yeah, yeah. And your trip to Disney as well, which we haven't talked about. Oh, right. Yeah. So when we got married, and I... I think 
Disney was banned in his, his church too, because he was from the Baptist tradition. I said, I've never been to Disney. And before we start adulting, I would love to just be a kid on our honeymoon and go to Disney. So he took me to Disney and yeah, like I said, we saw a, a supposedly transitional form there, which, which is still alive and existing today. So that was interesting. And, and yeah, just the, I didn't, you know, um, nothing horrible happened to me for going to Disney. <laughs> so, I mean, mostly, <laughs> mostly just too much, too much fun and excitement, um, that leaves you in a, in a kind of pool of exhaustion is, is what comes from going to theme parks. Um, yes. especially <laughs> ones that are all singing all dancing all performance all candy and I see why they don't want you going to places like that when you can experience the joys of mm. music and and you know Disney films and and cultural moments that a lot of people in these religious spaces aren't allowed to experience as children whereas typical children uh, have seen you know lots and lots of Disney movies and you had an experience at the theme park that contradicted what you had been taught in the church you know you saw something that contradicted something that you'd been taught there so you can see why they would deter individuals from going to those types of places because it as you said puts cracks in the perfect porcelain and it it kind of starts to break down all of those things that have been carefully put in place over many years over many hours um like a facade almost of of things that you can expect from life and if you live it a certain way so it's 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 really exciting I've never been to Disney but um I have kids now so I imagine that at one point there's no way around it but we'll have to wait and see <laughs> it is fun it is so much fun and yeah it it was it was eye-opening we had Ken Ham I'm sure you're familiar with Ken Ham come speak at our church so um, and, and for listeners who aren't familiar, he's an Australian, I believe, famous for visiting churches and, and teaching supposed facts, but they, they are not facts. They're, they're um, made up lies that evolution is, is not true. And uh, there's a lot of um, false logic that goes into his arguments as well. Oh, gosh. It's just one yeah. thing after another, isn't it? There's probably this yeah. big build up to this really big personality coming to the church and everybody makes everything perfect and everyone sits there and listens to this person in silence because they have so much truth and wisdom and it reinforces that this person must be speaking the truth because everybody's sitting there listening and it's such a big deal but it all comes back down to all of these big people in positions of power networking together to spread the same mistruths to gain more money um is 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 how it feels when i kind of look at it on paper so um i'm 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 so thankful for you having these small experiences that all culminated together to you eventually deciding to leave this church Yes, I'm grateful to be out too. It was like I told you in an email that there it wasn't all negative, but it was mostly mostly negative, and I was miserable. It, I'm very happy to be out of that environment. Mm -hmm. But in your emails, you also said that once you left, you were kind of floundering. There was this space where you had lots of time, and you're getting used to a big change in life and things have gone from all of your time being in this church to you meeting the man that is still your husband today and starting a family and then you find yourself becoming involved in something else yes yeah because I was still a stay-at-home mom and um you know sort of living 
parts of the lifestyle that I was, was raised to be in. And yeah, I was just looking kind of exploring, I guess. And yeah, I, I ended up in this other strange group. <laughs> and how did, it, you, it uh, this... how did you first, how did you first come across this group? My friend from a similar background as me had found it and I just followed her into it. And this group built itself as, you know, the, the top, the region's top dance company um, of a certain style. And I, I think that's typical in advertising, but I think it, it's also interesting to note, to put in context that I came from a church that, claimed it was the only one preaching the truth and with a capital T mm -hmm. right and into this group that was very particular about how things were done as well and claims that it was you know the top one so I thought that was interesting it is interesting it is and you, yeah. you your friend introduces you to this group what's your first experience like the first time you attend this this dance group Oh, yeah. So that's a good question. I was hesitant at first. There were some, some weird vibes I was picking up on. I thought, I, I noticed people sort of talking to each other on the, on, on the sidelines or, you know, whispering and giggling under their breaths during practice and I was like there's something going on here I don't I don't feel like it's a healthy environment and I didn't know why because I hadn't really been a part of any other groups um not not many and particularly not girl groups. Um, yeah, so, so I was getting, getting these vibes, but I thought it was, was me. I thought, oh, there's, there's something wrong with, with me. You know, I'm just, I'm just being, you know, uh, paranoid. I just need to, you know, get out of my comfort zone. Uh, that was, that was always a big thing that was pushed in my cult was getting out of your, your comfort zone. For, for example, soul winning. I was a shy person. And, and now that I look back on it, I also feel like there was a little bit of moral injury done there to be pushy about my beliefs onto somebody else who, who I was supposed to consider a friend. Right. And I wasn't viewing them as a friend. I was viewing them as a as a tool for conversion for, for points, right? right? Like they were part of my homework. So it was always this push to be out of your comfort zone, you know, worship more exuberantly and loudly and, you know, be more uh, extroverted. So I, I thought, okay, there's something wrong with me and I just need to get over it. So there's... Uh, chance that your experiences in childhood predispositioned you to ignoring warning signs when coming across another potentially destructive group? Certainly, yeah. And the biggest one was the self-blame that I had in internalized. It's an all-women's dance group. You go for yes. the first time and there are some weird feelings. Is there any aspect of love bombing or is it just you go, you observe and things are a bit weird? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there was much love bombing. Um, yeah, I don't know if they they did that to my friend. I was just kind of like, like tagging along kind of kind of like an add-on possibly 
Um, so yeah, it was just, it was just like this, this, um, I was picking up on some dissatisfaction. So, you know, people didn't feel like they could talk about things openly. It was, um, yeah, just like, just like an icky vibe. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. how many times a week did you begin attending this dance group? Twice a week. And then we had a gig or two on weekends, but we were expected to practice every minute of every day or, or, in, in, you know, encouraged. And again, me being me, I took that literally. And I took all of the director's suggestions and I practiced while I was waiting in line. I practiced, you know, with my feet waiting in line or in my head going over the steps during school pickups. You can still talk to my friends around my neighborhood and they will say, they will tell you all about my, my shuffling in the school parking lot. <laughs> I went over the steps while I was falling asleep. I listened to music in the car. There was an annual retreat as well, which was supposedly voluntary, but it wasn't really voluntary because people um, experienced ramifications for not going, even if it was for family or work commitment. So it took up quite a bit of time as well. Did you become an integral part of this dance group? Somebody that would be kind of a notable face that would be there at every session that would be part of any extra groups that got together to practice steps or anybody offering advice to others on, on those kind of, you, you mentioned when you were a child that you were seen as some kind of a goody two shoes. Is this something that also transferred when you were a part of this dance group? Oh, well, as to the first part, yeah, I, I did become an integral part of the group, I think. I, I ended up making my way into the full-time inner circle and sort of mentored the newcomers. Um, I created like a, a welcome session and we had activities to make them feel like a part of the group. And um, we, we all helped audition. Um, I was relied on to open the, the studio and close the studio and the director wasn't there. I did put in a lot of extra practice, um, compared to some of the other members. I kept doing the workshops and the classes and, so yeah, yeah, I, I I had a key and I was there in the studio on extra days as well. So it's taking over many parts of your existence. Yes, and it wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't discouraged, you know, that there was this this one time the director was sharing her dreams for the group and a couple of girls that were in the inner circle at that time were saying, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if I want to spend all that time traveling the world. I've got, you know, my family and my job and they just, you know, they just told her and she was not happy about that and and reamed them out in front of all of us and saying I thought that was you know the point of all of this and so yeah it was um it was a little more than a hobby <laughs> and and we were supposed to get paid but did not get paid much at all if anything and if we if we did it went back into the studio somehow usually do you, do you so, pay for the sessions that you attend? We did not pay for practice time, but we paid for, we ha there was a mandatory class that we had to take at, at a discount. We, we got discounts, but there was a mandatory class that we had to take. And 
um, we were encouraged to still take the workshops, which I did because I, I had more opportunities in the workshops to actually perform. And we paid for our costumes sometimes. We paid for all the extras like shoes and special undergarments, um, parking at the event, things like that. The retreat as well. Okay. Yeah, the retreat. I, yeah. I I want to hear all about the length, the cost, how far away it was, and the types of activities that took place whilst you were there. Was it kind of like a, a go, 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 go timetable, like nonstop? Yes, it was. When One time we went to New York City and we were on the scavenger hunt. And yeah, things got really weird there. A lot of a lot of stuff went down apparently during the scavenger hunt. I think just because everybody was feeling so rushed and competitive, and and the director had like a, a meltdown tantrum there. And um, we we went to a show, which which is very interesting to me now after the news with with Lizzo's group came out. Did. Did you happen to hear that? About I've Lizzo's heard that she, is, is she, she's being sued for creating a toxic work environment. I heard something along those lines. Yeah, one of the one of the incidents was that she had taken her dancers to a show. And I think, you know, part of this is dance culture. But as, as somebody told me, if it is, we still need to speak about it. So we went to the show and, you know, it was very sexy and some of us enjoyed it, but some of us, um, someone said, oh, I, I can't, you know, unsee that. I, I need to bleach my eyes now. And the director stormed off in the, in the middle of New York City alone, just like ditched us there. We had to go chase her to make sure she was safe. And I just thought it was interesting because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really voluntary to go to that show and it's not like we we did the same things it's not like we were getting any tips <laughs> from watching the show so um yeah it was just it was just um there was a lot of pressure you know yeah yeah and was this affecting your your life outside of the dance group you you said that you were spending a lot of time practicing listening to music are you finding that your family time is being affected by all of this my father-in-law got sick and I get to really say goodbye or visit him in the hospital because I tried to say well I, I did say I can't do this this number that you want me to do you know um I've got to go my father-in-law sick and the director said well if you don't do this number you can't do this other number that I had been practicing on you know so it was like an all or nothing I'm really not sure what she was trying to do there but I didn't want to um let down the the other girl that was doing the number with us and and I chose to do both and I kind of regret that decision so that that was the biggest regret but there was a lot of a lot of family sacrifices and I wasn't as present at work either and then one of the catalysts for me leaving was that I would I would keep getting these texts that would that would be really intrusive during important times like family vacation I was volunteering in the community and I I was helping coordinate an event where the mayor and my representative was attending and she would demand that I just drop everything and call her because she needed to discuss something. And sometimes it was about the number, sometimes it was, you know, um, just policing something. And yeah. I, I was like, this, this is really not okay. You know, this is crossing a boundary. So, um, yeah, that, that was, that was something that 
I got to talk about with some of the other girls and some, someone else mentioned the word abuse Mm -hmm. and yeah, I started to think I had valid grounds (laughs) for leaving, but I just want to say for any listeners out there, anytime you want to leave any group for whatever reason, even if it's not valid, you go right ahead. (laughs) It can be for a quote unquote stupid reason. And that reason could be you just don't want to anymore, you know? So hard to think about that rationally in the moment when you have all of this pressure and this environment that you are in without the space again to to think critically about those things though I mean Nicole now with all of your cult awareness and education that you have under your belt at this point you know whether it's been through independent research and um, you know and educating yourself or whether it's been taking courses online on statistics which I know <laughs> you've been you've been working through it it must be so much easier to to think about those things in hindsight and I wonder if you have any small bits of wisdom to offer people who might not be able to just put those two things together in this current moment in time yeah um so I would say if you think you're in an environment that's weird, right? Like I, I picked up on these vibes that, you know, it just wasn't, I was thinking this isn't positive, right? Like there's something going on here, maybe a little backstabbing and gossiping. I don't know, but um, listen to your gut and, that is so much easier said than done if you've been programmed not to. But if you think you're in a weird place, whether you you have the terminology to call it toxic or a cult or abuse, you don't have to stay, particularly if, yeah, this is, is complicated, but it's because I'm looking back on it now that 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 group did it it had advertised itself as being good good for me right it was advertised as body positive which it was not it was it was a way to get out of my comfort zone but the reasons I was feeling uncomfortable were valid it had nothing to do with performing I loved being on stage and making the audience smile and getting their feedback and talking to other performers that we met. It was was something about that group and, and that leader. Yeah. So, yeah. And don't feel like you have to stick anything out. Um, anything like that. Anything that's, you know, supposed to be a hobby or even a job. You might be able to switch jobs. Um, so yeah, that's my advice for people who think they might be in a toxic environment. Well, sometimes things can be good for you until they're not, and then it's okay Hmm. to, you know, and I, I think sometimes I speak to people who say that they were forever chasing either the love bombing feeling they experience when joining a group or, the community aspect of a group that they were born and raised in where they had these experiences or they didn't want to leave because they loved the people that they were around and the community that they were a part of, but it was just the financial abuse, the the psychological abuse, verbal abuse and false teachings or, or whatever the bad parts were. And it's the difficulty in weighing up that if I leave, I can't perform on stage anymore. I can't, make the audience feel the way that they feel when I'm performing, which is something that I love. So it's really difficult to also weigh those things up and say like, can I stick out these abuses, intrusive phone calls, demanding timetables to still have this positive part in my life? And I guess that could be a reason why some people decide to leave an abusive church and check out uh, you know, a slew of other churches, looking for that community without the abusive nature. Thankfully, some people I speak to manage to do that. It could be, you know, leaving a dance group and trying out a few other dance groups in 
in trying to 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 hold on to the positive parts of of what you were experiencing so I mean I don't know if you had those thoughts or feelings but I I've been in situations that have been good and bad and there is a point where you have to sit down and say how bad is the bad because if it is really affecting me my family my mental health if it's if it's going to negatively impact me for the rest of my life I can't survive in this environment There have been other times where things have been good and bad, like places I've worked in where you love everyone you work with, you love your job, but your manager is just an asshole. And you're like, okay, well, I need need money to live. Do I look for another job and end up with another manager like this? Or do I stick this out because I love what I do and I love who I work with? So there are some sort of um, typical worldly experiences that I think listeners who haven't had cultic experiences may be able to identify in weighing up this good and bad and whether you should stay or not. And I just I just didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, cer- certainly. And I think I think that is important to mention. And I'm I'm glad you you did, but that wasn't the only thing. I wasn't allowed to talk to ex members either. Um and there were some other very culty things and yeah the the leader was obviously dealing with some issues and and trying to commu- uh, create a community an intentional community and I think I think to go back to it to what you're saying the the question is can I still dance yes of, of course I can you know there are there are other ways to do that and I I wouldn't have to deal with how it was like in the studio in practice or being texted on the side by the director. There's going to be a way to do that without that particular unhealthy framework. So, so I think it's important for listeners to separate the, the, activity right whether it's dancing or going to church or a job or relationship from the manipulative framework and all of those red flags because yeah you can do you can do all sorts of things without that framework so yeah that that was that was a hard lesson, but it was important because I hadn't learned it yet. So as, as a joiner and being in the, in the inner, inner circle, it, it was a lot to process. (laughs) Um, the, not to say one's more difficult than the other because because there are special issues from being born in a group Mm. but the fact that I was listening to another podcast and I was listening because I knew I grew up in a cult and this like light bulb went off in my head and I went why does this apply to the group I just left to (laughs) why did I join? Why didn't I know? I just, I just brushed it off as, oh, I grew up like that. That's why I'm socially awkward, but it's not going to happen again. Right. That's what compelled me. The confusion of that compelled me into my research and into educating myself. And, and yeah, I just think it's so important for everyone, but especially children to have access to this education because had had I not been told by my parents that I was in a cult, I wouldn't have believed anyone, I don't think. Um, Yeah, and then had I not joined and figured out things from a joiner's perspective, I don't think I would have understood that I was vulnerable to do the same thing myself. Right. And 
in terms of the 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 director and your former pastor are there any parallels direct parallels that you can draw between the two of them and their personalities and the way that they presented themselves yes yeah i would say that um apart from the appearance of neatness they were very very similar my my pastor was very neat person um presented himself as well put together my director reminded me of somebody else's cult leader i'm reading a, a memoir now and they they talk about how their leader is always drunk and going on these you know tirades and and tantrums and who knows i was not in the pastor's inner circle so maybe he's different um when his guard is down i have no idea but their behavior was definitely similar um and um yeah there there were statements that she made that implied that she had been accused of being abusive in the past um she tried to swear me to secrecy about my experiences she had used to try to convince leavers to come back but had a very high turnover rate um and yeah the not not being able to talk to ex-members kind of trash talking everybody else in the community unless they they just happen to be in her good graces at the time um the competitiveness things things like that for sure in terms <laughs> of leaving this particular group was there one big catalyst or was it again the smaller things that were coming together to to create that overall decision for you to leave yeah it was it was more of those little things it was I was just tired of pushing away all those you know uh gut instincts like this is weird like like she's mean you know like <laughs> um why why wouldn't she hire this girl that was asking too many questions about about taxes why was why why didn't she hire this girl because she was you know too big for the current costumes why couldn't she just buy one that fit her um it was pushing all those questions away it did the the stress like she was just constantly harping and um i had to to do a lot of things in the studio to get through the evening or the day um psychological tricks like imagining a bubble around a protective bubble around me chewing gum for confidence um and my best friend offered me her prescription dr drugs and that was a line for me and i was like you know what i shouldn't be at work just to get through it and i'm definitely not gonna start taking drugs um yeah that that and then there was a girl who left um, and she said, you know, it's just not what it is. She preaches positivity, but, but it's not. And, and that girl leaving gave me, me the courage to leave because I, I knew I was going to leave, lose all my friends, um, uh, from that, that circle if I left. And, um, unfortunately I think she went back to it and she's, she's back there in, in a smaller capacity, but yeah, those, those things added up. I, I had health issues too. The stress was, was causing me um, nightmares and, and insomnia. I had um, my, my skin's immunity wasn't working as well. I had this mysterious condition that was kind of scary because my, my doctor thought it, it might've been cancer. So I get, had to get screened for cancer. Gosh. But after leaving, after a few months, it just cleared up on its own naturally. Um, and, you know, I got an answer from, from a dermatologist who explained, this is a normal thing that most people can handle, but because of, you know, stress, immunity, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, that, that was just all too much. It was just, you know, not sustainable as a a hobby or a job or whatever it was supposed to be which is unclear
what was your life like when you exited this environment was there a period again of you feeling like you were like floundering or not sure what to do with yourself and all of this free time or was it more of a kind of like a liberation and you can just take ownership of other activities and things and family time or maybe a combination of the of the two um yeah it was actually disorienting I didn't know what to do with myself because it had taken up so much time. And I even told a couple of girls, you know, as I, as I left, um, my, my excuse was supposedly that I didn't have time anymore. I, I said, I don't know what, what to do. You know, um, I think I'm gonna, gonna miss it. And I even thought for a time that I wanted to go back, but I just intuited that things would be worse for me if I did. And I wasn't sure what happened. I was still blaming myself. I, even after all those things that I told you about the leader's behavior, showing up to work drunk and saying all those negative things and just not being a person who could like really um, handle imperfection and criticize constructively and, and targeted people. I didn't... I thought that behavior was normal because that's how I grew up. And I thought it was all me. So my friend reinforced this. She told me that the directors or tax were due to me being weak, that I was making stuff up in order to leave, that I wanted to set the bar low so I didn't have to work hard. And I was surprised because when I talked to a few girls with her present, I had validation, verification, and amplification of these experiences with their own experiences. As I mentioned, somebody else brought up the word abuse. I was still confused, which I now know is because I was gaslit about the situation, but right. I... I had no context for that. So I was like, well, I need to work on myself. And I, I know I can't do it in this group. That was just too much for me. But oh, why is it too much for me? I, I'm too weak, you know? So I was confused until I heard about what makes a cult a cult or an abusive group, an abusive group. And I still had a lot of questions, you know, uh, like I said, why did everything that experts say also apply to my dance group, but not my hiking group or my community garden? Um, if I had experience in a cult already, and I, I knew what that experience was like, why did I stay for as long as I did and be miserable for as long as I did? So, yeah, I began my deep dive, which I am apt to do <laughs> for, for a lot of things that confuse me, especially. Um, and I loved it. I just, I, it, it was, it became not just about deconstructing my experience, but I realized how many people experience this and how little education the general population has. My parents, for example, who are smart people and normally very skeptical and do their research. Um, but even, I, I just saw this Nobel Prize winner on Twitter going down a conspiracy theory um, uh, rabbit hole and yeah, everyone needs this education around coercive control because these subtle psychological influences that are normal to an extent. And um, yeah, they can be used to manipulate people to one person's personal aims. 
we're often sharing resources and talking about different things. Um, and there's a book club that's not exclusive and no one has to pay any money. And if you can't make it, that's fine. And there's no pressure to come. And it sounds a bit, <laughs> it sounds a bit culty when I say to people, do you want to join our book club? But it's a, uh, it's a, a great way to <laughs> come <club>. together. <laughs> It's a, it, it, it's a great way to come together and just discuss some of our own thoughts and feelings around some of the stuff that we're consuming in the cult education space because we identify with the material so differently. And I think that's uh, quite a beautiful thing. Uh, of course, you and I are both going to have very different uh, experiences when we read certain things. But but your experience with um, Erica Borman, for example, who who comes along to book club, her experiences with the material are also going to be very different to your experiences. So it's really interesting to see what comes out of those discussions when we're in book club. And if anybody wants to come along to book club, it's a safe space. Um, and I'm not just advertising it as that. It's it's just a, a great way for people to get together and, and talk about their experiences um, with certain books, memoirs, research papers, I imagine at some point um and uh and i really enjoy it and you set that up so i i do appreciate that it's uh it's a nice little thing to be a part of well thank you for supporting me in that venture i uh i enjoy it because it also holds me accountable when i think oh i'll just read tomorrow i'll just read the next day and then i'm like it's book club i need to finish this book um, so it's really good for that. And uh, and I appreciate the little nudge it gives me to um, stop procrastinating because I do that far too much. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the idea. And that's hopefully an example of, you know, a positive outcome of of doing things in a group. <laughs> but yes. yes, you are you are free to not. Uh, show up you are free to not read the book and it does not cost anything and it, we meet just once a month um, not several times a week so yeah not several times a week but also you have to read the, <laughs> book, have to read the book at least once every day um, and, there's a, and there's a subscription and you don't have to come but if you don't come you're not allowed back in the group there's nothing like that it's a, a nice little safe space it's one of the one of the, the 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 things that we've talked about quite a lot before recording today is your hesitancy in sharing your story because you were worried that or you had some thoughts on how your story is not as severe in air quotes as other people's experiences that have been shared on this podcast and what you've just said about everybody having these experiences in smaller groups and these moments in their lives where things don't necessarily feel comfortable and wondering how you navigate that and get around that that's why these discussions are so important and everybody's experience counts and everybody's experiences matter and having a whole spectrum of conversations on this podcast reaches so many different people and there are things that you've said today that 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 resonate with me as somebody that hasn't had a cult experience so I imagine that there'll be so many people listening that will feel validated through what you've said in their own experiences and that's why it's important for everybody to share their experiences and I don't think that we can put a severity level on on anybody's personal and lived experiences because it's all relative isn't it I mean it's it's your life it's your whole existence um and for for anybody to be unsure of whether they should share their story because maybe people won't want to listen or maybe you feel like you don't want to share because some people have had horrific like sexually abusive experiences um and and we we haven't touched on any of that today but maybe that means you shouldn't share your story absolutely not everyone needs to share let's all keep sharing and and widening the awareness and the education and and validating everybody's experiences um and I think it's absolutely wonderful that you just do so much on your own just just there's there's no I mean I know we've spoken about interests in um, pursuing 
uh, degrees um, and and going into further education in this specific field. But we don't have to be enrolled in those courses to be doing all of that stuff. So I just appreciate you taking that leap and coming to talk with me today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I hope that's one of the um, outcomes of this interview because I want to help validate others with experiences that are just psychological in nature. As, as, as you know, I've had other um, abuses done to me and I didn't want to talk about them today, but the, my experience in, in my experience, the, the most harmful has been the psychological experience and, and the things the that could be different for everybody right but particularly if you've experienced sexual abuse and physical abuse if there's psychological experience um abuse after that such as gaslighting and you're not validated that can make it so much worse so yeah i hope that that everybody can take something away I absolutely agree with you. I, I definitely think people will. I know that I have taken things away from our conversation today and you just have such a calm and soothing presence about yourself. I know I've said this before, but you are just very soft when you speak. And, um, you know, I think I can be quite jarring and and, and quite extroverted. So it's it's like sitting with somebody who is talks a bit calmer and a bit and a bit softer is is really uh, refreshing and I just appreciate you as a person and for coming to chat with me we have a little um we have a little dm that we chat in um on twitter and and regularly on emails and stuff and I appreciate the support that you give me in the space and I'm glad that we were able to connect and I was so thankful that you came to share your story today when you emailed me and said let's do it I was like yes Nicole let's do it <laughs> yeah I'm happy to and um are you going to ask me if I have any additional advice for the listeners I am how did you know <laughs> how did you know so before we finish up today Nicole oh. I just wanted to ask you if there was anything that you wanted to add for anybody that might be listening who is going through some similar experiences to the ones that you've had Thank you for asking. <laughs> I did make sure I thought about this because I wanted to make sure I had some advice. Uh, as we talked about before, if you are going through something like this, don't feel like you need to stick it out. Listen to your, to your gut. And um, if you have left a situation like this, physically or mentally, I recommend Take Back Your Life by Yanya Lalich. That book has really helped me. And if you need to ask yourself some identity questions because you grew up in a cult like me, one question that I have loved to ask myself is what aspects of your personality did they try to squash what was not acceptable? Working backwards from there can really, really help. help. Um, you mentioned that I am a calm person maybe I don't know <laughs> and I disagree that you're not a calm person because because I like to listen to you before I go to bed but um <laughs> I um hope that didn't sound weird anyway um I learned that I'm more quiet and they wanted me to be loud and it's okay if I'm a more quiet person and I also want to take that bit of, of advice that I've heard going around to read five books. And I want to say, try telling five people that you trust about your experience to validate you. I think each time you get validation is going to um, really help with your, your healing and deconstruction. So yeah, I think that's really helped me. So thank you, Casey, for being another person to listen to my story. Thank you. You listen to me all the time. I get on my soapbox and I'm like ranting about things and blowing off steam. And I think it's important to to find those safe people and have those safe spaces, 
even when we're doing this work, because it can be traumatizing, it can be triggering, it's it's exhausting. And there's a lot of dark material that is is being worked through with with all of this work that takes place. So it's so important to find those people. And I've said this before, if people are looking for people to have that with but can't find them we are here and you can reach out to me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com at any time um because there is lots of of communicating that we can do but also signposting to relevant and appropriate support groups forums uh specialists counselors therapists there's a huge network at this point that we have access to that we can help people also have access to and it doesn't come with faux conditional love or money or any of those things I mean sometimes obviously counseling and therapy comes with money but it doesn't you know it doesn't come with the expectation that 10 percent 30 percent of your income is is going to have to be donated in in air quotes to the cause so there's there's so much that we can do to help people and and what you said about thinking about the the the, the special parts of you that make up who you are think about how they were squashed, but also think about how they were exploited. Because so many times when mm. individuals are recruited into groups, destructive groups, or who are plucked out of a group of individuals born and raised in a group and groomed almost for positions to continue that work and continue that indoctrination and, can, and are deployed to recruit other people and evangelize to other people, or to chill propaganda, whatever form it takes. There are qualities within you that are special, that are identified by predators, that are abused, that are exploited. So think about the special things that make you you and know that they are yours and no one else's. Um, and I think that that is a great line to finish on today. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with that. I, I do have experience with that too, and you're so right. And thank you so much for your time, Nicole. Thank you for being you. I appreciate you so much. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Let me know if you end up doing what you wanted to do and how it was. I will. I will. And I'll let you know what it's like. Um, um, it sounds a bit veiled. I'm just thinking about going to the <laughs> cinema. I'll go to the cinema to watch a film that Nicole also might go to the cinema or watch. So it's not, it sounded a bit, maybe like, maybe it could have been a little bit rude, but no, nothing like that. Um, I, if, I, if I end up going, I will let you know um, and give you my nuanced review um, of, of the movie Oppenheimer, which is what I'm planning to go and see. Uh, yeah, in the world, should be... amongst worldly people, doing a worldly thing. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Take care, Nicole. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.